The Lietze is often considered to be the third greatest text of Taoist thought, behind the Tao Te Ching, or Lao Tzu, and the Zhuangzi. The Lietze can be a great introductory text to an often misunderstood philosophy of life. Taoism can often seem irrational and contradictory, but the wisdom of the Taoist classics may be more relevant today than ever. Taoism is capable of acknowledging many of our modern beliefs about the human condition, like those of our insignificance, futile efforts, and inevitable death, yet it does not conclude that life is meaningless. Taoism crosses these concerns to another shore wherein no concern is rejected, but accepted in harmony with the natural course of things. Thus, it is said in the Lietze, For all men, poverty is the norm and death is the end. Abiding by the norm, awaiting my end, what is there to be concerned about? The Lietze is traditionally attributed to hundred schools of thought philosopher Lie Yuko, also known as Lietze. However, modern scholars do not attribute it to Lie Yuko in the 5th century BCE. Instead, they believe that the Lietze was a forgery by 4th century CE thinker Zhang Zhan. Either way, there is no doubt that the version available to us today is not the original version. Lietze is mentioned in the Zhuangzi on multiple accounts. But the one that says the most about the Lietze is when, in the Zhuangzi, it is said, There was Lietze, who rode on the wind and pursued his way, with an admirable indifference to all external things. But one need not take Zhuangzi's description of Lietze literally, for Lietze did not know if he was riding on the wind or if the wind was riding on him. This is a result of Zutran. Zutran plays a central component in the Lietze. Zitran is often translated as nature, but such a rendering does not contain all that the concept is. The two components of the compound are tzu and ran. Tzu meaning of oneself or for oneself, and ran meaning to be so or to be like this. This combined tzu-ran is what is so of itself, naturally so, or what is as it is. But we need not get caught up in the semantics. Let's have a look at its application. There are five direct references to sitran in the Lietze. I'd like to talk about three of them. The first is in the chapter Yellow Emperor, when the Yellow Emperor himself travels to a nation in accordance with the Tao, where he finds this. In this country, there are no teachers and leaders. All things follow their natural course. The people have no cravings and lusts. All men follow their natural course. Therefore, within the ideal place, men, along with all other things, are spontaneous in their action are so of themselves. Question of Tong. It is written of the things which do not need the five grains for food, nor floss silk for clothing, nor boat and car for travel. Their way is to be as they are of themselves. It is beyond the sage's understanding. For intellectual grasping or understanding is incapable of sitran. It requires the letting go of thought and knowledge. Finally, there is a beautiful passage in the chapter on endeavor and destiny. It is said inscrutably, in endless sequence, they come to pass of themselves by the way of heaven. Indifferently, the broken circle turns of itself by the way of heaven. Heaven and earth cannot offend against this. The wisdom of sages cannot defy this. Demons and goblins cannot cheat this. Being of themselves as they are silently brings them about, gives them serenity, gives them peace escorts them as they go, and welcomes them as they come. For peace and harmony lie within Zitran. Despite often being translated as nature, Zitran is not limited to the non-human. Graham points out that what separates humans from Zitran and the state of being so of ourselves is thought. Through thought, man creates motives, man creates good and bad. Nature, without thought, has no difficulty with Zitran. But man, overfilling with thoughts, does. For the man, weighed down by thoughts, is too heavy to ride the winds, like Lietze. It is said in the Lietze, When a drunken man is thrown from a cart, swiftly though he falls, it does not kill him. His bones and joints are the same as another man's, yet he is not harmed, as another man would be, because of the integrity of his spirit. He rides without knowing it, falls without knowing it. Zitran's counterpart is Wu Wei, or non-action, but it's only mentioned once in the Lietze. And if you should like to hear more about the concept of Wu Wei, I would suggest checking out my video, Taoism and Libertarianism.
In the Lietza, it is said, rejoicing in nothing and knowing nothing are the true rejoicing and the true knowledge. And so, you rejoice in everything, know everything, care about everything, do everything. But if this is the case, then how can anything be accomplished? This question brings us to the Lietza's fatalism. The Lietza provides an account of Taoist fatalism, which differs vastly from other forms of fatalism. Unlike Marxist materialism, there is not a destined purpose, and unlike Calvinist predeterminism, there is no divine plan. Things simply are as they are. They were what they were, and they will be what they will be. There is nothing that we can do to change this, for endeavor is powerless against destiny. The motto of Lietze's fatalism is therefore, it is what it is. The story of Qi Liang describes this. Qi Liang is a man who falls ill. His sons, concerned, bring him three different doctors. The first, a typical doctor, attributes the sickness to irregular meals, sexual overindulgence, and worrying too much. Qi Liang tolerates no such response. The second, a good doctor, attributes the sickness to the circumstances of his mother's womb and breasts. Qi Liang appreciates this response. The third, a divine doctor, does not attribute a cause and asks instead what medicine and the needle could possibly do for Qi Liang. Qi Liang celebrates this response, and the Lietza goes on to say, Valuing life cannot preserve it. Taking care of the body cannot do it good. Scorning life cannot shorten it. Neglecting the body cannot do it harm. Hence, some who value life do not live. Some who scorn it do not die. Some who take care of the body do it no good. Some who neglect it do it no harm. This seems unreasonable, but it is not. In these cases, life and death, good and harm, all things come about themselves. Why would we toil over them? Thus, Graham writes, if we ought to train ourselves to allow our actions to be so of themselves, destined instead of forced by conscious endeavor, then pure fatalism is healthy instead of baleful, precisely because it undermines our faith in the utility of conscious choice. Such fatalism is not intended to spur inertia. Instead, it should motivate spontaneous action. It is so often that we look back with regret at that which we could have done better, and it is so often that we look forward with anxiety, fearing what we may do poorly. The Lietze's fatalism would extinguish both of these. All of this is to say, get out of your own way. Everything is constantly moving. There is nothing we can do about it. Through trying, you fail. So get out of your own way. And when you flow with the flow of things, you too can ride on the wind. The first chapter of the Lietze is largely devoted to arguments for the acceptance of death. Graham separates these out into five different arguments. First, the yin and yang of life and death. Life and death are yet another change of the yin and yang. Lietze's master said, birth and change are the norm. Things for which birth and change are the norm are at all times being born and changing. They simply follow the alternations of the yin and yang and the four seasons. This mimics the story of the death of Zhuangzi's wife, where Zhuangzi says, now there's been another change and she's dead. It's just like the progression of the four seasons. Death is yet another transformation in the universal process of transformation. Second, our self is an illusion. Life is not our possession, thus we are never quite living. Lietze said, only he and I know that you were never born and will never die. Is it he who is truly miserable? Is it we who are truly happy? And your life is not your possession. You are the breath of heaven and earth which goes to and fro, how can you ever possess it? Third, the nothingness we came from is our home. Death is a return. This passage mimics the Tao Te Ching in placing non-being before being. Thus death brings us back to non-being. In the Lietza, it is written, man in due course returns to the germs. All the myriad things come out of germs and go back to germs. What is born must die, what comes up must come down. For back with the germs is what in the Lietze is considered our true home. Fourth, one cannot be certain of what death entails. Lin Lei was a man near death, yet extremely happy. When questioned how he does so, he said, death is a return to where we set out from when we were born. So how do I know that when I die here, I shall not be born somewhere else? How do I know that life and death are not as good as each other? How do I know that it is not a delusion to crave anxiously for life? How do I know that present death would not be better than my past life. For this response, Lin Lei was described to be a man who had found it, 
but not all of it. Fifth, life is toil, death is rest. The last is the simplest of all. Life is a great toil, and death is a well-earned rest. Within the Lietza, it says, Great is death, the gentleman finds rest in it, the mean man submits to it. If death is rest, why should anyone fear it? On top of all of this, the Lietza, in this chapter, is hostile towards immortality, saying, Whatever ends cannot escape its end, just as what is born cannot escape birth. And to wish to live forever, and have no more ending, is to be deluded about our lot. However, there is no lack of mentions of immortals in the rest of the Lietza, possibly indicating either a difference between mythology and philosophy, or just internal contradictions. For Lao Tzu's and Zhuangzi's take on death, have a look at my video on death in the Tao. The Lietza cannot be talked about in depth without acknowledging the seventh of the eight chapters, that is the chapter about Yang Chu. The chapter of Yang Chu advocates for unadulterated hedonism. It shares ideas that run directly against Taoist ideas and those shared in the rest of the Lietza. As in the third chapter, a hedonistic ruler looks back at his life and says, Alas, I who am king have neglected virtue for pleasure. Will not future generations look back and blame me for my errors? For this reason, no matter the original author of the Lietza, the chapter on Yang Chu was likely added by another, a hedonist. The second author used Yang Chu as the proponent of his ideas, similar to how Confucius was used to espouse Taoist ideas earlier on in the Lietza. The historical Yang Chu, who the secondary author bases his work on, was not quite as much of a hedonist. Yang Chu was a thinker from the Warring States period, like Lie Yuko, whose ethics opposed those of the Confucians and Moists because they were a form of egoism, not all that opposed to hedonism. The youngest concept of Weiwo, or everything for myself, may further suggest that. But while the historical Yang Chu did not favor personal pleasures over health, the Lietzi's Yang Chu's only focus is on pleasure. For as he suggests, what is man to live for? Where is he to find happiness? Only in fine clothes and good food, music and beautiful woman. The historical Yang Chu was accepted within Tao circles for his emphasis on the cultivation of one's personal life. It is safe to say that the Lietzi's Yang Chu would not have been. Their claims that the text was quite influenced by Buddhism, as shown in its suggestion of a karmic view of destiny and an understanding of perceptions as illusion. This, however, would come as no surprise if the text was truly written in the 4th century by Zhang Zhan during a time of growing Buddhist influence. That's all I have to say about the Lietza. Thank you for watching. Feel free to let me know anything you thought I left out, or anything that you disagree with. And until next time.